Now we're going to look at algorithms, particularly those associated with arrays and lists, namely algorithms for searching through arrays and lists and also for sorting them. The simplest of these is surely a linear search, a search through a list or array for a particular matching value. In a linear search, we simply start at the beginning and we iterate through every value, comparing those values against what we're looking for until we find a match. So here, for example, is a function in Python which performs a linear search on a list. The first parameter takes in the list itself, and the second parameter is the value which we're searching for. What we want returned is the index, the location of the value in the list. So it should be an integer value from 0 up to, but not including, the length of the list. And understand that we search from the start of the list. So if matching values are located at multiple places in the list, what we get back is the index of the first occurrence. In the case where the list contains no such value, when there is no match, we simply return negative 1 as a special value indicating not found. This is a common convention with search functions. Negative 1 indicates that there is no such match. So looking at the body of our function, our for and loop iterates over sequence, which is the range from 0 up to, but not including, the length of the list. So say, if the length of the list is 5, then our loop will go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and 4 will be the last iteration. In the loop, we simply test whether the value at that index in the list matches the value we're searching for, and if so, we return the index. If our loop is exhausted with no matches found, then we return negative 1. Now, you'll note that there's nothing really clever at all about the linear search algorithm. It performs a search for a particular value in really the most obvious way possible. For this particular problem, though, there really isn't a better solution. There are plenty of more sophisticated search algorithms, but those algorithms don't apply to the general case of having just a big dump of stuff in no particular order. For example, what's called a binary search is a much more efficient kind of search, but you can only use it on lists or arrays where the items are sorted. The gist of the binary search is that we start our search not at the beginning, but actually in the middle. If the value in the middle happens by luck to match what we're searching for, then our search is done. Otherwise, if the value there is greater than what we're searching for, then we know we need to look to its left. Otherwise, if it is less than the value we're searching for, then we need to search to the right. And so, with our first comparison, we have effectively eliminated a whole half of the list from consideration. We know the value can't be found there. In the remaining range of the list where the value still might be found, we continue with the same strategy. We look in the middle of that range and we can make a comparison. And if it happens to match the value we're searching for, then we've, we, we're done, we've found the value. Otherwise, we know to either look to its left or its right, depending upon whether the value there is greater than or less than the value we are searching for. So here, for example, we have a sorted list where the first item is negative 7 and the last value is 1881. And notice that all the values are in ascending order. And if we wish to find the value 340 in the list to retrieve the index at which it is located, assuming it is located at all in the list, uh, we start in the middle, and we see that the value there, 178, is not equal to 340. It's in fact less than 340. So we know that the value we're searching for is somewhere to the right of that index. So we know now that the value isn't in the range from the first index, index 0, up to and including the index we just compared. In the subrange that remains, we jump to the middle there, and we compare that value against 340, and we see that it is greater than 340, so the value we're looking for, 340, must occur earlier than this index, if in fact it is present at all in the list. So one last time, we jump to the middle of the remaining range, though in this case the range left has an even number of elements, so there's no precise middle. We either have to have our algorithm uh, round down or round up in such cases. In this case, we're rounding up, and it turns out that, oh, we've actually landed on the value we're searching for. And having found the value we're searching for, the algorithm returns the index, which in this case is 7. So one way to think about this algorithm is that we are effectively shrinking the range in which we are searching. It is contracting as we search. So in our binary search function implementing this algorithm, again, we take in two parameters, the list itself and the value we're searching for, and we're going to return the index of the found value, or negative 1 if it's not found at all. And we're going to use two local variables, start index and end index, which denotes the range within the list which we are searching. And of course, at the start, we're searching the entire list, so we initialize start index to 0 and end index to the last index of the list, which is, of course, 1 less than the length of the list. As long as we have a subrange left to search, the start index will be less than or equal to the end index. 
in each iteration, we find the middle index, mid IDX, retrieve the value at that index, and compare it against the value. And if it's equal to the value, then we found the index. Mid index is the index we are searching for. Otherwise, if it is less than the value we're searching for, then we know that that index and everything to its left is no longer part of the valid search range. So we need to adjust the start index to be actually one greater than the middle index. And conversely, if the middle value is actually greater than the value we're searching for, then we know that the value will not be found off to the right. So we adjust the end index. We bring it in to be one less than the middle index. What will then happen in a case where we're searching for a value not found in the list is that in the last iteration, the start index or end index will be adjusted such that the end index and start index cross over. The end index ends up less than the start index. And so our loop condition tests false and we return negative one. Notice at the line at the top of the loop where we get the mid index value that we use the int function to round off whatever gets returned from the division by two. If it happens to be uh, something 0.5, then we want that to be rounded. Because, of course, indexes to a list are always integers, not floating point numbers. Unlike in searching, when it comes to sorting, we have more than a few different options for the general case of an unsorted list. We're going to look at just five, starting with the infamous bubble sort and ending with the accurately named quick sort, which note that yes is intentionally spelt as one word rather than two, unlike all the other sorts. So the general strategy of the bubble sort algorithm is that we work from the start of the list to the end of the list, comparing each adjacent pair of items and swapping those which are in the wrong order. So here we have our unsorted list of E, B, C, A, D, which of course properly sorted would be A, B, C, D, E. And in our first pass through the list, we will compare the first element and the second element, E and B, uh, the second element and the third, the third and the fourth, and the fourth and the fifth. And as we do so left to right, and we swap them as we compare. We swap them if they are not in the correct order. So first off, is E less than B? No, it is not, so we need to swap them. That puts E in the second position, which we compare against C in the third position, and those two are out of order, so we swap them. C ends up in the second position, and E in the third. And then we compare E in the third position with A in the fourth, and those again are out of order, so we swap them. Uh, A gets moved into the third position, and E in the fourth. And then finally, E compared to D, again, those are out of order, so we swap them, and D ends up in the fourth position, and E in the fifth. Now, of course, the list is still not sorted, but this is just our first pass. We now do a second pass, but this time we do one less comparison and swap. So we compare B against C, that's the correct order, so we don't need to swap them. Then we compare C against A, and those are out of order, so we have to swap them. A ends up in second position, and C in third. Then we compare third position C against fourth position D. Those are in correct order, so there's no swap there. And after our second pass, we end up with B, A, C, D, E. Again, still not sorted, but again, there's another pass. Again, with one less comparison than the previous pass. So we're just comparing B against A. Those are out of order. We swap them. And then B against C. Those are in order, so no need to swap. And notice now that our list is now properly sorted. Uh, however, if the data had been different, if things were mixed differently at the start, um, it's still possible that the first and second item would be out of order. So we actually have one more pass to do, in which we compare one less item from the previous pass. So we just compare the first and second. But of course, A and B are still in correct order, so we don't swap them. The point, though, is that the algorithm doesn't know that in some cases it might finish early. It might not need to do the last few passes. But that all depends on the particular unordering of our list at the start. Now, you may have noticed a pattern with bubble sort that after the first pass, the last item is in its proper position, and then after the second pass, the next to last item is in its proper position, and then after the third pass, the, uh, the next to next last item is in its proper position, and so forth. So one way to think of bubble sort is that it's effectively like we are finding the item that goes at the end of the list, and then the next to last item, and then the next to next last item. And this pattern continues until the very last pass, where actually we're putting the very last two pieces in their place, the, the first and second item. Again, note, though, that in some cases, depending upon how the data is unsorted to begin with, some items may find their place early. Like, notice that D, the second to last item, finds its place after the first pass, so it actually finds its place one pass early. And actually, in this case, the same can be said of C, B, and A. They all find their place one step early. In any case, looking at how we would implement this in code, we have our function bubble sort, which takes one parameter, the list which we are sorting, and in the body we have two loops. The outer one, for each pass through the algorithm, 
and then the inner one for iterating through the comparisons made in each pass. Recall from our example that we had five items and yet we did four passes, because the pattern with bubble sort is that the number of passes is one less than the number of items in the list. And in the inner loop, the number of comparisons we do starts off one less than the length of the list, but gets smaller by one by each pass. So from the length of the list we subtract one, and also we subtract the index of which pass this is. In the first pass, the pass index will be zero, and in the last pass it will actually be two less than the length of the list. Because again, recall that the range function creates a range from zero up to, but not including, the number specified, and in our outer loop we specified a range of length of list minus one. So if the list has a length of five, then the argument to range is four, producing a range of zero, one, two, three. So in the last pass, it will end up that our inner loop will only do just one iteration. Now in the inner loop, we do our comparison, and if the items are out of order, we do our swap. We get our two comparison values, A and B, the item at index I and I plus one, and if A is greater than B, then we swap them. Notice that our comparison is done here using just a greater than operator, and that works great assuming that we are ordering a list of numbers. Other data types, though, don't necessarily have defined behavior with the greater than operator. For those cases, you generally have to define your own semantics of what it means for one value to be greater than another, and you would do so by implementing your own function and then uh, using that function as the comparison in a sorting algorithm. For simplicity though, we're just going to illustrate sorting with the assumption that we're talking about sorting numbers, so we're just going to use the greater than and less than operators. The general strategy of the insertion sort algorithm is to take values from the so-called unsorted portion of the list and insert them into a sorted portion of the list. That is, a portion of the list where the items are sorted at least relative to each other. This is basically the same strategy people often use in real life, like say if you wanted to sort a deck of cards. You would take a card off the top, or maybe just a random card from the stack, and you'd place it in a new stack, and as you do this one by one, as you take cards from the original stack, and place them in the new one, in the new stack you would keep them sorted relative to each other as you add the cards. So you draw cards one by one, and insert them into place. Insertion sort is that same idea, except most commonly it's done such that we are using the same space, the same list, um, to keep both the unsorted portion and the sorted portion. So we start off by simply designating the first item as being the sorted portion of the list, and given that it has just one item, well of course it's naturally sorted within itself. Notice that we're designating the unsorted portion with a red outline and the sorted portion with an orange outline. Then in the first pass we take the first item from the unsorted portion of the list, in this case B, and we insert it into the sorted portion of the list. In the next pass we do the same thing, we take the first value of the unsorted portion, in this case C, and insert it into its proper place in the sorted portion. In each pass we keep doing this, taking the first unsorted value and inserting it into the sorted portion of the list until the whole list is sorted. One thing to note about the pattern of insertion sort is that it's not until after the very last pass that we know for sure that every item is in its proper position. Until then, you have, yes, the sorted list is growing, and some items may end up in their final position in earlier passes, but it's not until after the very last pass that we know that any and all items are in their proper position. Now, as for the actual insertion process, the way it works is that we compare the value to insert with the value to its left, and if the insertion value is less than the value to its left, then we swap them and do it again. We compare the insertion value to the new value to its left, and if it is less than that value, then we swap them. So basically, we walk the insertion value uh, one step to the left until finally it either reaches the front of the list, or we find that the value to its left is less than that insertion value. So here, in the second pass, when we insert C into the sorted list, C is less than E, so we swap those two values and then when we compare C against B, C of course is greater than B, so the insertion value is actually now in its proper place. Looking now at code for insertion sort, we have a function insertion sort that takes one parameter, the list to sort, and again we have two loops. The outer loop, which iterates for each pass of the algorithm for the insertion of each item, and the inner loop, which does the actual insertion. Note that in the outer loop we are iterating from index 1 up to, but not including, the length of the list. So in a five element list, we're gonna iterate from one to two to three to four. Again, we don't have to insert the first item into the sorted portion of the list because we just designate that first item as itself being the sorted portion of the list. 
So we actually start by inserting the second item of the list, not the first. Now in our inner loop, we are iterating from the index of the item to insert, its original position, down to, but not including, zero. That's what the third argument to range here means, that we are counting down, not up, and we're counting down in steps of one. So when index has, say, the value five, uh, then range here represents the sequence of five, four, three, two, one. And then inside our inner loop is where we do our comparison and swap. So first we get the two values to compare uh, the value at insertion index and the value uh, just before insertion index, insertion index minus one. We compare them, and if the value to the left is less than or equal to the insertion value, then we are done with this pass of the algorithm. We're done inserting this value. So we break out of the inner loop. Otherwise, we do a swap and go to the next iteration. If in a particular insertion pass, A never tests less than or equal to B, then we'll never break, and the insertion value will end up in the first position of the list. It'll end up at index zero, and we'll move on to the next pass, to the next insertion. The selection sort is a variant on the basic idea of the insertion sort, whereby we have an unsorted portion of the list from which we take values one by one and place them into the sorted portion of the list. In a selection sort, we don't just take any value or the first value from the unsorted portion, we find the smallest value still in the unsorted portion, and we tack that on to the end of the sorted portion. What this produces is a sorting pattern that almost looks like the reverse of the bubble sort, whereas bubble sort effectively finds the values which go at the end of the list first and works its ways backwards, in selection sort, the order is front to back. We first find the item that goes at the front, then the next item, then the next, and so on, until we've sorted the entire list. So here in this example, in the first pass, we identify A as the smallest value in the unsorted portion of the list, so we swap it to the front of the list, so A and E swap places. And then in the second pass, we find that B is the lowest value, so we swap it to the next position, and it swaps with C. Then in the third pass, C is the smallest value in the unsorted portion of the list, so we swap that into the next position, we swap it with D. Uh, and then finally in the last pass, D is the smallest value, so we swap that into place. And of course, logically, once every value but one is in their proper place, then of course that last value must also be in its proper place. So note that the last pass, just like in bubble sort, actually puts two values in their place, not just one. In our selection sort function, we again just take one argument, the list to sort, and again we have two loops, one nested within the other. The outer loop represents each pass through the algorithm, and the number of passes, like in bubble sort, is one less than the length of the list. Target index here refers to the index of the list to which we are going to swap the smallest value in the unsorted portion of the list. So in the first iteration, we swap that smallest value to index zero, in the next pass, we swap it to index 1, then index 2, then 3, 4, and so on. Within each pass, our inner loop is where we will scan to find the smallest value in the unsorted portion of the list. And for this purpose, we iterate from target index plus 1 up to, but not including, the length of the list. So, for example, if we're in the second pass of sorting the list of length 5, then target index will have the value 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. That's our first argument to range and len of ls is 5, so range here will return a sequence of 2, 3, and 4. Now, to be clear, what we're looking for in each pass is not the minimum value per se. We don't really care what that value is. We want to know where it's located. We want its index. So before our inner loop, we start off assigning a local min index, uh, the value of target index, and min value, the value at that location. Then in the inner loop, we get the value at index i, and if it is less than the current min value, then we update min value with this value and min index with this index. Then once our loop completes, min value should contain the smallest value in the unsorted portion, and min index should have its index. With this information, we can then swap the minimum value into place. We can swap it with the value at target index. The gist of the merge sort is a divide and conquer strategy. We first consider each element as if it's its own sublist, and then we take pairs of those sublists and merge them together. And it's in the merger process that we sort the items. So the result of each merger is a sorted sublist. 
We keep merging these sublists until finally everything is merged back into one sorted list. What makes this generally one of the more efficient sorting algorithms is how we do the merge process. Say we're merging the sublists C and E and A and G, and again be clear that we always merge sublists which are in themselves sorted. So note that C and E, that's properly sorted, and A and G, that's also properly sorted. Now, to merge these two sublists, we could just concatenate them together and then sort the result using any other sort algorithm, but the whole point of the merge sort is that we have an efficient way of merging two sorted lists into one unified sorted list. The way this process works is we compare the first items of both respective lists, and we take the smaller of the two values as the first item for our merged list. So here in the comparison of C and A, A is the smaller value, so we take A. Having already taken A, A is no longer valid for consideration, so we do a new comparison this time again between C, but now with the next value of the second list, the G. And so in that comparison, C and G, C is smaller, so we take C. And now C has been consumed, so in the next comparison, we compare the next value in that list, E, again against G, and E is smaller than G, so we take E as the next value in our merged list. And then finally, one of the two lists has been exhausted, so we just take the remaining values from the other list. In this case, just the value G. So we end up with our merged list of A, C, E, and G. Expressed as a function, the merge process looks like this. We have a function merge, which takes two lists as arguments, the first we call left and the second we call right, the left list and the right list, though it doesn't matter which one is which, that's just a convention with merge to refer to the left list and the right list. And in the function, our goal is to produce a new merged list, which we initialize starting out empty, and also we're going to need an index keeping track of our progress through the left list, and an index keeping track of our progress through the right list, and we initialize both of those to zero, to the start of those two lists. The actual work is then done in an infinite loop, with actually four mutually exclusive cases, because in each iteration we have four different cases. There's the case where the right side list has been exhausted, in which case right index will be greater than or equal to the length of the right list. There's the case where the left list has been exhausted, in which case left index will be greater than or equal to the length of the left list. And then there's the case where neither has been exhausted, and in our comparison of the values at left index and right index in the respective lists, the value in the left list is smaller than the right list. And finally, in the last case, it might be that the value at right index in the right list is smaller than the value at left index in the left list. So again, we have the top two cases where no comparison is done because one of the two lists has been exhausted. And then in the two bottom cases, neither list has been exhausted, so we do a comparison, and in one case the left value is smaller, and in the other the right value is smaller. In the case where we do the comparison and the left value is smaller, then we take that value and we append it to the merged list, and we increment left index by one, in the case where the right list value is smaller, we take that value and append it to the end of the merged list and in increment right index by 1. And then in the case where the right side list has been exhausted, we want to take the remaining values from the left list, append them to the merged list, and we're done. We return that result. In the case where the left list is exhausted first, we take the remaining values of the right list and we append them to the merged list and return that result. Note that the controlling condition of the list here is simply true, because we want the list to just iterate indefinitely until within the loop uh, we get one of the two cases where either list has been exhausted, and so we return a list. Because one or the other list will get exhausted eventually, this isn't an infinite loop. In case you're confused about the Python code here, recall that a colon inside the subscript operator used on a list, that's a special syntax for selecting a range for a list. So when we write left subscript left index colon end subscript that doesn't return just a single value from the left list it returns as a list all of the values in the left list from left index to the end the plus operator here then takes that list and concatenates it to the end of the merged list if you have two lists a and b a plus b will concatenate first all of the items of a and then all of the items of b into a new list and that here is the list we are returning, the concatenation of merged plus all the remaining items from the left list. Now that we have our merge function, we can write a function to do the actual merge sort. 
The function is quite simple, but perhaps a bit tricky to understand because it's recursive. In the base case here, which you may recall in recursion refers to the case which terminates the chain of recursion. It's the, it's the case in which no more recursive calls are made. In the base case here, if length of the list is less than or equal to 1, then merge sort simply returns the list itself. Which makes sense because, of course, a list of 0 or 1 items is always sorted. It can't possibly be unsorted. If, however, the length of the list is greater than 1, then we split that list into two separate lists, a left list and a right list, then recursively sort those two lists with the merge sort function, and then finally use our merge function to merge together those two separately sorted lists, the left and the right, and that's what we return. So consider a simple case of a list of four elements. We pass that into merge sort, which then splits it into two even lists, a left and a right, which are then both independently passed to merge sort. In each of those calls to merge sort, the list of two items is split itself into two separate lists, each of one item, and those left and right lists are passed individually to the merge sort function. And in those merge sort calls, because the lists have one element, we've hit the base case. So those single item lists get returned unchanged from these deepest calls to merge sort. The two single item lists returned from merge sort get assigned to left and right, and then merged. So the basic pattern is that first, as many recursive calls are made as is necessary to split everything down into single element lists, those single element lists then get merged together into two element lists, and the two element lists then get merged into four element lists, and so on, until we finally merged everything back together into one list. A quick note again about the syntax here. In the first subscript of ls, where we have colon mid-index, that, again, is special Python syntax for extracting a range from a list. In this case, everything in the range from 0 up to, but not including, mid-index. So here, for the left list, we're taking everything up to, but not including, mid-index. And then for the right list, we're taking everything at mid-index up through the end. That's what that syntax means with the colon. Another thing to note here is that merge sort really doesn't require us to strictly split the list down the middle. Uh, we actually could split the list uh, randomly into, into a left and right list. It, it doesn't really matter. It, it'll work um, however we split the lists. Though, of course, it usually makes most sense to just divide the workload into even chunks. So that's usually why we just split the list down the middle. Like the merge sort, quick sort is a recursive divide and conquer process. In this algorithm, though, we split the list into two by selecting a so-called pivot value which could be any random value from the list, and then filing the remaining elements into two sublists, one for the values less than the pivot, the other for values greater. We then recursively repeat this process for both of those sublists. So here, for example, we'll keep things simple and pick just the last value in the list as our pivot rather than pick randomly. So our pivot is D, and then we go through the remaining elements sequentially left to right and file them into the two lists, the one to the right of the pivot and the one to the left. C, A, and B are all less than D, so they make up the left list, and E, F, and G are all greater than D, so they form the right list. We then recursively do the same with the two sublists, again not picking pivots at random, but rather just using the last value. So our two pivots are B and G. So B ends up with A to its left and C to its right, whereas G ends up with E and F to its left. Notice in this case there were no values greater than G, so there's nothing to G's right. We now recursively apply this same logic to the three sublists. A and C are the only elements in their lists, so of course they are selected as the pivot. And then in the list of E and F, F is the last value, so we select that as our pivot. And we end up with A without anything to its left or right, because of course it was the only element in its list. And the same for C, but then F has a single element E to its left. Recursively applying this logic one last time, we use E as a pivot, but of course there are no other values, so it has nothing to its left or right. So now, here in the end, we've recursively applied the process until every value has been used as a pivot. The way our sorted list gets constructed is that when the recursive call on the left and right sublists returns, the sorted sublists they return get concatenated with the pivot in the middle. So, for example, in the case of our pivot B, its sublists are A and C, and those are both just single element lists, so they are the recursive base case. They just get returned as is and then those two sublists are concatenated with B in the middle. Then in the case of pivot D, 
its recursive call on the sublist CAB, that returns the sorted list of A, B, and C, which we just concatenated together. And D's right sublist, EFG, should also come back sorted. So now we can concatenate those together with D in the middle. So now, looking at a function for quick sort, again, it, we just take one argument, the list to sort, and first off, we have our base case, the case where the length of the list is less than or equal to 1, in which case we just return the list itself, because of course a list of one element has nothing to sort. When the list is longer than one element, first what we do is we get the pivot value, and again, we'll just use the last value in the list as our pivot, and recall that in Python, when you specify a negative index, you're getting the elements relative from the end, so negative 1 is the last element in the list. We then get a list of all the remaining elements, all the elements but the pivot, and assign it to a variable rest. That's what subscript colon negative 1 does. It, it returns a list of all the elements but the last. And then we create our left and right sublists, which start out empty, but then we loop through all the values in rest, and if that value is less than pivot, then we append it to the left list, otherwise we append it to the right list. We then recursively quick sort the left and right list, and once those recursive calls return with the properly sorted list, we concatenate them together with pivot in the middle, and this produces the sorted list which we return. Note that when we do the concatenation, we put pivot in its own list, because otherwise pivot is just a non-list value, and you can't concatenate a non-list with a list, so we have to put it into a list first. Now, the version of quicksort I just showed you is not the usual version, because what we did involved producing several extra lists. In practice, quicksort is usually implemented in an in-place fashion, meaning we sort by moving things around within the original list, rather than producing additional lists. The way an in-place quicksort works partly explains why we chose the last element as our pivot, because it makes most sense for this in-place method. We start off by initializing what we'll call the pivot destination index, represented by a blue arrow, to the first element. We're then going to iterate from index 0 up to, but not including, the last index, and we're going to compare the value at that index against the pivot. And if it is less than the pivot, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to swap the value at that index with the value at the pivot destination index, and then after that, we're going to increment the pivot destination index by 1. So here's how this plays out in this example. First we start at index 0, compare that against the pivot as indicated by the dotted line, and no, the value e is not less than the pivot, so we're not going to do anything in this pass. If it were, we would swap this value with the value at the pivot destination index, though in this case the pivot destination index is the same location, so there would be no actual swap, but we would then increment the pivot destination index. So it does matter that we compare the pivot against this first element, because it might be the case that we want to advance the pivot destination index in this pass. In this case, though, we don't do that. In the second pass, we're now comparing the item at index 1, the second element, against the pivot. Is C less than D? Yes, it is. So we're going to swap that location with the location of the pivot destination index, so C and E get swapped, and also we advance the pivot destination index by 1. In the next pass, we compare index 2, the third item, against the pivot, and yes, A is less than D, so we perform a swap with that location and the location of the pivot destination index, so we swap E and A, and then we increment the pivot destination index. In the next pass, we compare index 3, the fourth item, B, against the pivot D, and yes, B is less than D, so we swap that location with the location of the pivot destination index, so once again we're swapping with E, and then we increment the pivot destination index. So now we're done with our loop, but our final step is to actually swap the pivot with the pivot destination index. So E and D get swapped, and we end up with our properly partitioned, as we say, list. Our pivot D now has only smaller values to its left, and larger values to its right. Looking at the code for this process, again, first we start by getting the pivot value, and we initialize our pivot destination index to 0. Then we iterate from index 0 up to the second to last index, so up to but not including the index, which is the length of the list minus 1. And in the loop, we see if the value at the current index is less than the pivot, and if so, we are going to swap the value at that index with the pivot destination index, and then increment the pivot destination index by 1. Notice here, uh, for simplicity, I'm presuming the existence of a swap method just to make the code more compact. The Python list type doesn't actually have such a swap method, but just assume what this does is it takes the two index values and swaps the values at those indexes in the list. 
In any case, once our loop is done, our final step is to swap the values at the pivot destination index with the pivot itself, which is still sitting at index negative 1. Now, for the sake of our in-place quicksort function, we're actually going to need a more general version of this partitioning process where we can specify a start and end index, that is, take some range of an existing list and partition it in this fashion as if that range is its own sublist. Like, for example, if we specify a start index of 10 and an end index of 50, then we're partitioning all the values in that range using the last value, the, the value at index 50, as the pivot. So here's a partition function which does just this. It takes three arguments, a list, a start index, and an end index, and it's going to partition the elements starting at start index and ending and including the end index. So the value at end index is what we're going to use as our pivot. This code actually looks just like what we just saw, except we're using start index in place where we used index 0, and we're using end index in place where previously we were using uh, negative 1. Note though, at the end, when we're done partitioning, what we return is the pivot destination index, because that's the information which our quicksort algorithm is going to need. So here is that quicksort function, and because it's going to work recursively, we have to add the arguments for start index and end index. This means if you want to pass in a whole list to sort, you're simply going to specify a start index of 0 and an end index, which is one less than the length of that list. Looking now at the code, first thing we do is test whether the start index is less than the end index, because first off, in the case where the range has just one element, the start index is going to be equal to the end index, in which case we want to do nothing. And also we do this test because in cases where the partitioning ends up with no values, to either the left or right, some of the recursive calls to quicksort are going to have a start index that's actually greater than an end index. And those are actually our base cases. Again, they're cases where we want to do nothing because there's nothing left to sort recursively. For the so-called normal case, where the start index is actually less than end index because there's more than one item in the specified range, first thing we do is we partition our range by invoking partition with start index and end index and that returns the index of where the pivot ended up in that partitioning. So then we can recursively sort the range to the left of the pivot index and also the range to the right. So the left side of the list will run from start index up to pivot index minus 1, and the right side list will run from pivot index plus 1 up to n index. Notice that there isn't any concatenating to do because the sorting all happens in place. We never here have more than just the one list, and we're just moving things around within that list. When we consider the performance of an algorithm, we have two basic concerns of efficiency, how much space in memory ends up getting used, and how much time is taken to complete the job. The obvious way to measure performance, then, is to monitor memory usage and also get out a stopwatch, see how long it takes to perform any particular algorithm. But doing these things, particularly the latter, is not generally useful. The same algorithm run on different systems, or run at different times on the same system, or runs on the same algorithm with different input data, in all these cases, you could end up with very different numbers. So empirical measurements are first of all difficult to do, and secondly, of dubious utility. In the formal analysis of algorithm running time, what we concern ourselves with is not an algorithm's running time on the clock, but rather its so-called time complexity, which is a characterization as a function of how the running time changes, how it grows, as the input size operated upon by the algorithm grows. So for example, with a sorting algorithm, the question is, how much more work must it do to sort a list of a thousand items compared to sorting a list of a hundred items? How much more work must be done as the set of input data gets larger and larger? What's called big O notation, as in a capital O, is a notation in which we take the time complexity function and reduce it to a simpler function. Or put more accurately and mathematically, big O notation describes what's called the limiting behavior of a function as the argument to the function, in this case the input data size, tends towards a particular value or infinity. In this case we're concerned about infinity. To put it another way, big O notation characterizes a function by its growth rate. The idea, as you'll see, is that certain factors aren't really relevant, because in the long run, as the input data set gets larger and larger and larger, those factors just don't have much influence on the general shape of the curve. So consider, first of all, the time complexity function for the linear search algorithm. 
And actually, there's not just one time complexity function, there are three. There's a function expressing how much work must be done in the best case, in the case taking the least amount of work. There's a function for the worst case, the case that will take the most amount of work. And then there's the function that characterizes the average case. Well, if n is the length of the list we are searching through, in the best case, the element we're searching for is the very first item. So all that gets done is just one unit of work. In this best case, our loop only has to iterate once. In the worst case, the value that we're looking for is at the very end of the list, in which case we end up having to iterate through the entire list. So the time complexity function of the worst case is n. And then in the average case, the element we're looking for is in the middle. So the average case is 1 half n. I, I should note here that usually in this analysis, we consider only comparisons to be a unit of work. For the sake of this analysis, when you look at the statements of the code, you just ignore every other statement. All we're concerned with are the comparisons. This simplification tends to work out well because for every branch and for every loop, there's one comparison. And it's the branching and looping with an algorithm that primarily influences how much work gets done as the data input size grows. In any case, now we have the time complexity functions for the best case, worst case, and average case, but how do these functions end up getting reduced in big O notation? Well, for our best case, which consists of just the constant 1, this remains unchanged in big O notation. Likewise, with the worst case, n is simply remains n. In the average case, however, the factor with n is considered irrelevant, because while 1 half n is a slower rate of growth than n, for the sake of broadly characterizing the function by its rate of growth, it's considered extraneous information, so we just reduce it to on. What we really care about with big O notation is which of these curves does the rate of growth of our algorithm most resemble. In the very best case, our algorithm doesn't take any more work to perform as the input gets larger and larger. In other words, it's a constant time algorithm, denoted as O1. And understand that the big O notation is always O1, and not O2 or O3 or O4 or O5. If our algorithm always takes, say, five comparisons to perform no matter what the input size, we reduce that to O1. Because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about five steps to perform an algorithm or one. All we care about here is the rate of growth. And whether an algorithm always takes a thousand steps to perform no matter the input, or just one step to perform no matter the size of the input, those rates of growth are the same. So we denote them both as O1. Of the rates of growth shown here, the worst one by far is n factorial. The curve of the factorial function grows extremely rapidly. So an algorithm with a time complexity of O n factorial won't do well with large sets of data. As the data set gets large, the amount of work which the algorithm must do explodes, likely making the algorithm impractical to use on large or even moderately sized sets of input data. So n factorial is definitely not desirable, and n squared is pretty bad as well. n log n and n are generally pretty reasonable. And then best of all, aside from O1, is O log n, which very nicely decelerates its growth as n gets larger and larger. So be clear that despite how it may look in this diagram, the log n curve does keep going up and up and up as n gets larger. It just it levels off to a very, very gradual curve. So a question is, in which kind of algorithms can we expect to get log n? Well, the general answer is an algorithm in which with each step, with each iteration, we cut down the set of work. And recall, this is precisely what the binary search does. With each iteration of binary search, we are removing from consideration uh, a whole half of the remaining data set. So whereas the best case for binary search is, again, one, a constant time search, because it may happen that we, uh, just there in the middle is the value we're looking for, but then, in the worst case, the time complexity function works out to be, for reasons I won't uh, detail, uh, log base 2n plus 1, and in the average case, log base 2n minus 1. Expressed in big O notation, 1 becomes simply O1, uh, log n plus 1 becomes simply log n, because the plus 1 is not really going to change the shape of the curve, it's just going to move it up slightly. And also note that we generally leave out the base 2 part of log n, because that's just understood. And lastly, in the average case, log base 2 n minus 1 again becomes O log n. We just drop the minus 1, because again, that just slightly shifts the curve without really changing the shape of the curve. So formally, we can see here, at least in terms of time complexity, binary search is a very efficient algorithm. 
Though I must say that in practice, when binary search is executed on real hardware, the way binary search jumps around the list isn't very conducive to performance on today's CPUs that are very reliant upon caches. Because if you recall from an earlier unit, the way the CPU cache tends to work is that when you access uh, an address in memory, a chunk of the surrounding addresses are brought along with it automatically into the cache. Because the general presumption of the CPU is that when we access address, we are very likely to then want to access stuff that is near that address. Binary search uh, thwarts that expectation. So actually in practice, especially when it comes to searching through smaller lists, binary search may actually be less efficient than, than just a simple linear search, because linear search will likely trigger fewer cache misses. Lastly, looking again at the five sorting algorithms we considered, here are their time complexities expressed in big O notation for the best average and worst cases. And note that quicksort and merge sort both have in-place variants. In the case of quicksort, we're considering the in-place version, and in the case of merge sort, this is the not in-place version. The clear winners here are quicksort and merge sort, because n log n is a shallower function than n squared. n squared is a steeper rate of growth. And while insertion sort and bubble sort have a best case of n, those are just the best cases, and best cases are generally not considered typical. Mainly what we're concerned with are average cases and worst cases. Those are generally far more important. As to whether quicksort or merge sort is preferable, well, merge sort seems to have the advantage in that its worst case is still n log n rather than n squared. But in practice, quicksort in the best and average cases tends to execute faster than merge sort. So quicksort actually is probably the most commonly used. The main disadvantage of merge sort is that its operation requires more memory. And finally, while bubble sort is never really used in practice, a selection sort and insertion sort, despite having bad growth characteristics, are actually quite efficient on at least smaller lists. So they are sometimes used when the amount of data to sort is known to be small.